Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There's an old gospel song that was a real favorite with the old camp meetings. I don't know if any of you are old enough to have gone to the old camp meetings. Uh, having grown up in Arkansas, they were a regular thing. And those of you who grew up in Georgia, it's probably a regular thing also. But the camp meetings, uh, usually someone would come through, some evangelist, and they'd put up a camp, uh, a tent, and they would have a revival or some kind of camp meeting. Sometimes churches sponsored them. I know it was really, really big in Georgia for the United Methodist Church to sponsor these. And so they, they even had whole camps that were set aside simply for these annual camp meetings. And uh, one of the favorite, one of the favorite songs that were in that, those meetings, was a song which, which was Freed from the Law, O Happy Condition. Freed from the Law, O Happy Condition. Has anybody here ever heard that song or know that song? You can find it on uh, the internet if you want to hear it. But it was, a, it was a favorite. And it was usually the kind of song that you would sing at an evangelistic meeting because it really encouraged people uh, to turn their life over to Jesus Christ. But the chorus of that song is what I want to uh, pinpoint today. The chorus of that song was... Once for all, O sinner, receive it. Once for all, O friend, now believe it. Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Christ has redeemed us once for all. Once for all. And that's the title of our message today, Once for All. What does that mean? Well, if you look at our epistle text, Hebrews chapter 10, especially verse 10, which is not in, our, in your... They didn't put it. I don't know why they didn't put verse 10 in the tricope. It starts with 11, but this is verse 10. It says in verse 10, and they and, and by that will, that is the will of the Father in Jesus Christ, by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We have been made holy by the body of Jesus Christ. One, the sacrifice of that body once for all. Now, on one really hot day in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, there was a man by the name of Kobo Mbeke, and he had been attending uh, at uh, Kisangani uh, Cathedral. They have a big cathedral at Kisangani, and he had been uh, going to an uh, evangelistic meeting there. They had this big meeting, and he had attended it. And uh, uh, the day after the meeting, he, he was going to take a bus back to his hometown of Lubutu. And as they were going down the road on the town to Lubutu, they were stopped by a band uh, of bandits, Islamist, Islamist bandits, who had come from north, uh, uh, north Kivu, uh, part of the Congo near Uganda. And they had come down this road. It's the main road actually leads to North Kivu. And they stopped the bus. And as they stopped the bus that he was on, they ordered everyone off of the bus. And when they ordered everyone off of the bus, they asked, now all you who are Muslim, you stand over here. And all you that are Christian stand over here. So Mbeke, he joined the dozen or so people in the Christian group and about 15 or so other people uh, in the, were over in the Muslim group. <coughs> Then these bandits took all the baggage that was in the bus and they threw it out onto the road and uh, they told the uh, Muslim passengers, now, you collect your bags. So they all collected their bags. Then the bandits ransacked all the Christian bags. So they opened them all up, scattered everything out, took whatever they thought was of value, and the leader of the group grabbed Mbeke's, uh, Gobo Mbeke's uh, bag. And so he found a book in there. The book was nondescript. In other words, it didn't have any writing on it or anything. And uh, he opened it up, looked at it, and he, he couldn't quite read it. So he said, whose book is this? It was the Bible. And Baker immediately stepped forward and said, well, that's, that's my book. That's my book. He said, what is this book? He says, it's the Bible. Okay. When he heard that, then he opened it up, began tearing pages out of it, and throwing the pages up. The wind was catching the pages and flying, flying around. He was tearing up the, the book. And uh, all of a sudden then he just, he just, this uh, Islamist just reached up and grabbed a page out of the air. And he handed it to uh, Kobo and said, eat this. And so he stepped forward and he took it out of his hand. 
And when he took it out of his hands, his eyes fell on the verse. Fell on what book it was. It was Hebrews. And it fell on the verse 10.10. Hebrews 10.10. And he smiled a big smile. Yes, sir. And he wadded up and stuffed it in his mouth. And everybody, the Islamists laughed. They thought that was hilarious, you know. So they gathered up all the stuff they did. They got back and commandeered the bus and headed on down the road, leaving all the Christians by the side of the road to find their own way back to wherever they were going. Right? On, the, in that, on that hot day. So as, as the bus just disappeared into a cloud of dust, uh, with some of the Christians kind of cursing after the Muslims, you know, um, one of the brothers came up to Mbeke and said to him, said, uh, why were you smiling when he handed you, when he was desecrating your Bible and handed you that page to eat, and why did you put it in your mouth? And so he said, well, I, he took it out of his mouth and began to unfold it. He said, well, I had to. He said, what do you mean you had to do that? What, what, are, you, what are you getting at? Brother, I had to smile because this is the verse that I fell on. And it was this one. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. For by one sacrifice, He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Okay? And so He said to His brother, how could I not smile at that? You see? No matter where we are, no matter what we have to undergo, and we're warned by Jesus in the Gospel account now, that may be a very rough road. It may be a road of persecution. It may be a road where we're hated. The road we're traveling. A lot of our brothers and sisters drive down roads where they are hated. And, and we know this in Nigeria. We know this in, in uh, uh, parts of, of East Africa. We know this in parts of India. We know this where we, we have ministries, we have missions. We know this. And yet we do not always understand the true meaning of what sacrifice means. And the word sacrifice is used. Sometimes I, I, kind of, uh, I kind of chuckle, you know, at the Lenten season, you know, we try to do some sacrifices, you know. And so we give up things like broccoli, you know, and stuff like that. And so uh, and we, you know, I have this sacrifice. I won't eat broccoli, especially broccoli dipped in chocolate. You know, I'm not going to have any of that. And uh, so we have these things we think we're going to, we're sacrificing, right? And I, I always chuckle at that a little bit, you know, uh, because... Sacrifice really means something different. Uh, there's a lo lot of different ideas we have in our mind about what that is. Now, we just had Veterans Day. And we understand, we do understand, we had a nice little video that kind of uh, highlighted the fact that it's really a sacrifice. Uh, that really going into the military is a sacrifice. And sometimes it is an ultimate, people pay the ultimate price, the ultimate sacrifice uh, for serving their country. And we have that now, we fully can kind of understand that as, as being sacrificed. With the economy sometimes, when the economy is up and the economy is down, we understand what we have to sometimes sacrifice in order to make, to make the bills, in order to get the bills paid. Now, those are kinds of sacrifices, and those sacrifices are put upon us, perhaps, by circumstances outside ourselves. As Jesus warned his disciples, now there are going to be wars, there are going to be kingdoms fighting his kingdoms, uh, there's going to be uh, political uh, upheavals. There's going to be natural upheavals. What about the, about the, the people who uh, suffered at the hurricanes recently down in the panhandle? You know, some who have lost everything. How about Paradise, California that no longer exists? 98% of the structures of that town burned to the ground. You see? There are people who have sacrificed a lot and have because of circumstances in their life had to. Uh, and, and so these, that's sacrifice. Sacrifice is really a loss. Uh, and so we hear the word, uh, and, and yet we, as we sit in relative comfort in our houses or in our, our church, sometimes we don't grasp the, the full meaning of what that means. There's a story about a teenage uh, girl uh, who uh, uh, had a... Uh, just, idea that she was going to do something and she was going to have a, uh, a money making now we are removed somewhat from sacrifice a lot of people are now she didn't go to the war this was after world war ii she didn't go to the war we're removed from that we're re removed from this idea of war she didn't ever go to the war but this was something she had 
plan to do to make some money after the war. You know, when the Hebrews talked about sacrifice, Hebrews understood very plainly that sacrifice meant that they were building a relationship with God for sacrificing because of their sin. We know all the way back from Genesis that animal sacrifice was the way to show that God was paying for our sins and would pay for our sins. We're somewhat disconnected from that life of blood sacrifice. We're, we're, we're disconnected from it to some extent. They were not. They understood that something had to die for our sin. Okay? Now, this girl found out what mink coats cost. So she got the idea that she was going to get a bunch of mink and raise them and sell their fur for mink coats and make a lot of money. So she got all these little mink, she raised them up until they, were, they themselves were reproducing, and she said, now's the time, now I can make some money. She calls up a furrier and says to the furrier, she says, I have a bunch of mink, I have a bunch of mink, how do I shave their fur off and how much will you pay me for it? And the guy on the other said, lady, you don't shave mink, you skin them. You kill them and you skin them. She dropped the phone and ran to her room crying. She couldn't imagine killing her little pets and skinning them for a coat. You know? And that started the whole thing about no fur coats in, in America. No, it did not. <laughs> but it's that kind of attitude, right? So she said, no, 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 no we can't do this. You, she, she couldn't understand that in order for her to have the income she thought she was going to have, it meant something had to die. And that was too much for her to take. It was too much for her to consider. She abandoned that project. I don't know if she took the mink out, you know, and let them go or not, but the fact is that in Hebrews chapter 10 here, God is asking for us to consider the reality, what it really means to sacrifice. Because that's what Jesus was going to do. We should better, I think, appreciate what it means to have Jesus' death on the cross to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Ours, not His. He didn't die for our sins. Just like the lambs they were bringing to the temple, just like the goats they are bringing to the temple, didn't commit any sins. Unless you have fainting goats. But, you know, they didn't commit any sins. Why would God take their life? Because I sinned. Because you sinned. Because the one offering the sacrifice sinned. And so that whole idea, that whole sacrificial system was pointing to the one last thing that God would do. Listen to how Moses set it up in Exodus chapter 24. Now, Moses has been given a pattern from God about how to make the people right before God. Okay? Remember when Moses was at the burning bush and the Lord was speaking to him from the burning bush. What, what did he keep saying? I'm not the guy. Don't send me. You know, you've picked the wrong person. I mean, he, that's not in the text, but the idea is he wanted to get out of it. And there were two reasons why he wanted to get out of it, I think. One is because he was afraid. He had had to flee Egypt in the first place to keep from being uh, uh, put to death for killing an Egyptian. Now, he understood that he did not want to sacrifice. He had a wife children, flocks. Did he, imagine what he had to sacrifice. He even had to leave his wife behind to go back to Egypt. He did not want that. Right? He goes back. He come, they come to Mount Sinai. He spends time on the mountain. He gets the law. And this is what he says to the people. Now he's going to say, God has made a covenant with you and we're going to celebrate this covenant together and this is how this covenant, which God has established with us, is to be carried out. And as you carry this out, what you are saying, you will obey God. This is what it says. So Moses came to the people, and he told the people the words that the Lord had given him, all of the rules, ordinances, etc. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words of the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now that's pretty easy to do. That's easy. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. It's like your confirmation students who forget by the time the confirmation uh, party is over at the end of that, that Sunday, 
they have forgotten that they stood up in front of the whole congregation and said, I will die rather than give up Jesus. They all say it. They all say it. I'll die rather than give up Jesus. I wonder how many remember that, you know, by the end of that school year, that they actually said that. This is what, the, see, it's easy to say. We will do this. We will follow it. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning the next day. Early in the morning. He built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. If you go to Saudi Arabia today to what is considered Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, if you go there today, it's, it, it has a fence around it. The Muslims put a fence around it. But if you go around it, you can find these 12 heaps of stone. They're still there. And so he, he, he set up these pillars. Basically, big, huge stacks of stones. And he sent young men to the people of Israel who offered, uh, to offer burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings uh, of oxen to the Lord. So they made a sacrifice to the Lord. All, the whole community. And these young men were out there to, the, probably Levites were out there to, to do this. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins. And half of the blood he threw against the altar. Now, why? When the altar represents God. He represent, that represents them dealing with God, communicating with God. To throw the blood on the altar is God saying, if I don't keep my word, then it's on me. That's what he's saying. If I don't keep my word, then it's on me. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. So this is what you're agreeing to, he's saying to them. He read it in the pit. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. Now they add this. See, they said that already. Now that they've heard it. Now they add this. We will be obedient. Not only have we heard and agreed to it, we will obey it. Then what happens? Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant of the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And what he means, not only all the words that were in the law, that's God's part, but all the words related to them that they said they would obey. And he now put the blood on them. The blood is on the altar. God is saying, hey, it's on me if I don't do it. The blood is now on them. Hey, it's on you if you don't do it. Now the sacrifice have a little bit of more understanding of where we are and how we got where we are today sitting here before the <coughs> Almighty God through Jesus Christ. So God's people covered in the blood of the sacrifice now for this covenant ceremony promised to follow Yahweh. They promised to follow God. And the only thing that they didn't keep, the only thing was they didn't keep the promise. They didn't keep, did God keep His end? Read the Pentateuch. Read the, the Old Testament. God never failed. Never failed. And when they were nearly 2,000 years out of the land, He brought them back anyway back in 1948. <coughs> God never failed them. He never failed them. Therefore, because of their rebellion, because they didn't keep it, they need to be covered with sacrificial blood in a remembrance all the time. All the time they need to be making sacrifices because they broke the covenant. In order to restore their relationship with God, therefore, these sacrifices had to be continually made. Continually made. Okay? Some people have, have referred to the uh, temple in Jerusalem as a slaughterhouse. Because literally, they had to be made. They had to be made. Why did they have to be made? Because as Hebrews now tells us, the book of Hebrews, the sacrifices did not have the power to totally redeem from sin and the sins of the people. Because they kept repeating them, this had to keep being repeated. They were merely a foreshadowing of the once for all sacrifice for sin in Jesus Christ who is the Lamb of God. And, and we've even seen that, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We, we, we reprise that in our liturgy. <laughs> Do you, know what that, do you know what you're reprising when you say that? When you sing that, 
or say that Sunday after Sunday? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That Lamb died to do that. Shed blood to do that for you. So thus the greatest day of the Jewish calendar then becomes this day when this once and all when this once sacrifice is done annually is done for the people of God that their sins be forgiven. <clears throat> that their sins be forgiven. The day uh, is supposed to restore this relationship that sin has divided between God and His people. It's called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And on that day, what happens on that Day of Atonement? On that Day of Atonement, there's a sacrifice made. The high priest makes a sacrifice. And he makes a sacrifice for himself. And, then, and, and there's sacrifices that are made. And he keeps the blood. There's a basin of blood. This is what Moses did in the day. So there's this basin of blood. Okay, it goes on the altar. Then he takes it. And once a year, this is only happens once a year, and only the high priest can do this. No one else can do this. And it's a pretty awesome thing because if you remember in the Old Testament, when any, kind, when any priest attempted to approach God without being told to, or anybody attempted to go to the ark when they weren't supposed to, they dropped dead. So these high priests are thinking they have bells on the end of their robes so that the people could hear that they're moving around in there. If they stopped hearing the bells, they had to go in and, and not go in and get them. They pulled them out from a cord that was tied to their ankle so they didn't have to go in there. He goes in, and what does he do? He takes that basin of blood, and he pours that on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. He pours it over the lid. Why does he pour it over the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, which was in there? Moses had put, what, the staff of Aaron, the, the manna, and the law there. What does that mean? The rule and authority of the, of, the, of the priesthood and the people, the law that the people were supposed to keep, and the provision of God for the people. That's what it represented. So it represented basically everything God had to do in His relationship with His people. And they poured the blood over the... Why? Because it says that God sits above... The majesty of God sits above... The mercy seat. So when God, this is very, very anthropomorphic, but when God then looks at the blood, He is seeing the commitment of the people that they've broken. He's seeing it through the blood of the sacrifice. Friend, you don't get into heaven unless you're covered with the blood of Jesus. That's how God sees you. That's how your sins are remitted for all eternity, once for all, in Jesus. And that's what he did. That's what they understood was taking place behind that curtain that the high priest was doing, okay, to, to take care of sin. But he did it year after year, decade after decade, right? He did it. They did it century after century until they were taken away in... Um, bondage uh, into Babylon. And what did they do when they returned and rebuilt the temple? They started it over again. And that happened until Titus destroyed it. The Roman general Titus destroyed it in 70 AD. And it has not been done since. What did Jesus say in our gospel today? I tell you, you see all these wonderful buildings? Not one stone, every stone will be thrown down, not one will be left. There's not one stone of the temple left. You have a wailing wall, but that was a retaining wall. It wasn't part of the temple. There's no part. Nothing is there. Not one stone of it. Massive stones. None of it is there. Even after Herod built one of the most magnificent temples in antiquity, it's not there. Because the temple is now the people of God. This We are the temple of God. The people of God is where He dwells now. And we dwell because of His once for all sacrifices. And sacrifice on the cross. And those outside of that are not dwelling in the temple of God. So His hope was that God would recognize the blood. That's what the Hebrew wanted. That He would recognize that blood. That Yahweh would forgive Him. That the most uh, holy place where He was there behind the curtain that that would be uh, sufficient to take care of their sin for the year. It is still done 
now. I, I know in one community, I was in a Jewish community, in which uh, they would, on the, on the Day of Atonement, they would write their sin on a stone. Whatever their big sin was for that year, they would write it on a stone and throw it in the Mississippi River. So that some way to, to atone, to get God to atone for uh, what has happened. The work of simple human beings, the high priest never finished. However, the descendants of Aaron, year after year, could not do this. God had promised Abraham and his descendants, from Adam to Noah to Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, all the way up to David, that he would provide one that would reign forever. He would provide the one that would take care of the sacrifices once and for all. Here's how it says in Hebrews chapter 10. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away our sins. Remember, it can, never, it can only atone for them to, for, a, for a time. It never takes them completely away. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, his sacrifice was so accepted that he is now back in the Trinity. You know, the, the, the human Christ is in the Trinity. Waiting from that time until his enemies are put under his feet as a footstool. For by a single offering, he has perfected, that perfected means completed, totally completed, for all time, those who are being sanctified, that is made holy. Where there is forgiveness of sin for these who have been made holy, there is no longer any offering for sin. What he's trying to tell the people that are tied into the sacrificial system is that was just a shadow. The real came in the person of Jesus. Your sins were remitted for all eternity by the cross of Christ. That is why we often, you often heard people say in a pietistic way, if you've sinned, just turn to the cross. Right? Just turn to the cross. Well, that was never meant to be a, 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 like a, a sacrament or some, you know, all I do is turn to the cross and my sins are taken care of. No, it really meant remember what happened on the cross. Remember what happened. God's plan for reconciliation for his people to himself was never meant to stop with the sacrifices of bulls and goats and sheep and all or any other kind of animal, turtle, turtle doves or whatever they, they gave or any sacrifice that would need to be repeated over and over again. It was never meant to be that way. It was never, never meant to be that way. By the way, if you were, if you were a, a, a person, let's say you were someone like Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night. We see him there in the third chapter of John. We see him again at the end of John taking care of the body of Jesus. You see Nicodemus there. Now Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Nicodemus was completely sold out to this system. He absolutely believed this system was the way you got right with God. And what did Jesus say to him? What was he saying? That, that he just blew his mind. You must be born again. And this is what else he said to him. Flesh only gives life to flesh. But spirit gives life to spirit. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that to, for Nicodemus to hear that was incredible. But Nicodemus as we see him later, as we see him defending Jesus in the council of the Sanhedrin, and as we see him later, he understood. He did understand. We've been doing these sacrifices for centuries on top of centuries, on top of centuries, millennia even. And look at the condition we're still in. Where is the Messiah? The Messiah is the one who takes it away forever. All this business, this, if you will, blood atonement of the temple. And for God to kind of put a period at the end of that, He took away the temple. He took away the temple. Where that is supposed to take place. I once asked a rabbi, how do your people get atonement today? There's no temple. How are they atoned today? And this was His answer. We don't know. The only thing He could come up with is in the end, our good has to outweigh our bad, I guess. He knew of no way to be atoned. 
very soon. Because there was no temple for atonement. There was none. Now, today, there are chicken sacrifices at, at the temple area, but those are not even, those are not even a, a, a acceptable in the sense there is no temple. There is no altar. There is no holy of holies to put the blood on. Because the blood was put on the Holy One forever and forever, and then on you and me by faith. Yahweh, God himself, would provide the spotless lamb as a once-for-all sacrifice for the sins of the world. This is what St. Paul wrote in Galatians. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We are not just people who sin and have to have it atoned. We actually belong to the household of God. This is repeated over and over again in the writings of Paul. What did John the Baptist say in John 1.29? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he invited his disciples to start following Jesus. That's the one that will take away all the sin for good. So the ultimate and final sacrifice for sins was born. He was born in Bethlehem. He came fully into this world as God. He came, uh, he came uh, as a man into this world, the incarnation. And Christ's mission, Christ's mission was to come into this sin-soaked world and by his blood redeem it. By his blood shed on the cross. There are some commentators that believe he actually, he actually shed every drop of blood in his body. They actually believe that. Now, you may not know that, but in the sacrificial system, you were not supposed to eat the blood. All the blood was to be poured out before the, the uh, Thanksgiving offering or anything was made. It was to be poured out. He poured out all of his blood to redeem us before he was even taken down from the cross. That's what some commentators say. Some people believe that. That happened. Because blood and water came out of his chest when it was pierced. He came to suffer the justice and the wrath of God that you and I, that you and I would suffer without being redeemed. Without our sins being expunged as Jesus did it. There was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Jesus died on the Roman cross. That was so that you and I you and I, and all who would repent of their sin by faith would stand in the presence of God redeemed, the presence of God accepted as His children. No longer would there be access, would the access be limited because of who the high priest was and that, that He did it once a year. Yahweh God has provided a way, His Son, Jesus. And you and I have a tremendous amount of confidence because of it. Look what it says later in this uh, uh, book of Hebrews. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places up with the, uh, 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 by the blood of Christ. In other words, only the priest could go in the holy place. What happened when Jesus died on the cross? The curtain of the temple was rent from top to bottom. There was now no longer any barrier between us and the Father. Right? It was done by Him. And so by this new and living way, new and living way is a way of saying, this is God's new covenant. And it is a living one. Why? Because the sacrifice has risen from the dead. And so the sacrifice is actually before God for all eternity. Interceding for you and me. The blood of the priest doesn't have to be put on there to intercede for you once a year. The blood of Jesus Christ is interceding for you constantly at the right hand of the Father. This is incredible stuff. <clears throat> totally unique in the history of all the world. So why do we need to keep making sacrifices of blood when in fact that blood that was sacrificed is eternally before the Father interceding for you and me, Romans 8. Jesus Christ who died more than that who rose from the dead is also at the Father interceding for us. This is the blood. It's a perpetual blood. That's why it doesn't have to be repeated either ceremonially in some rite or ritual as some, some churches do, but no, it does. It's a remembrance. It's a remembrance of what he's done. And since we have a great, a great priest over the house of God, which is Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, 
with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Pure water. That's why John would say later that, and testify that I am a witness. I saw the blood and the water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. See, he promised Moses when he took that blood and put it on the altar. That was a promise that God would keep his part. He is faithful. He finally fulfilled His faithful promise to give the sacrifice once for all. So let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works, encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching, the day of the Lord's coming. So when we remember these things, then we realize that there is no such thing as, a, as cheap grace. Our grace came at a very high price. The price of Jesus Christ upon the cross has set us absolutely free from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. How are we to respond to this then? Well, our response is to share it. All that He has given us, all that Jesus gave, at, uh, commanded, if you will, commanded, us, before He ascended into heaven, ascended to the right hand of the Father, before He did that, all He did was say, go out there and share this. Tell people about me. Tell them everything you learned about me. Tell them everything you learned about me. Share it with them. And pour water on them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you something. I'm going to be in that with you until the very end. That, that's what we're supposed to do with this good news. That's what we're supposed to do with it. Share it every way you can. We're motivated to share it. Are you not motivated? Do you realize that you are a son and daughter of God because Jesus Christ died on the cross, covered you with His blood, you have put on Christ in your new creation. Why wouldn't you share that? Why wouldn't Paul, after he finally got the message on the road to Damascus, and after he had gotten his training at Mount Horeb in, in, in Arabia, after he had gotten that training, there was no stopping Paul to tell the whole world. He was compelled. He was compelled to tell the whole world. At least the whole Roman world as he could, that he could get to. And when it came time that he had to go to Rome, he made sure that Rome paid for it. They paid the bill to get him there. Do you have any idea? Do you, have, do you know how many people it took to get him from Jerusalem to the coast? You probably don't know. It, talk, it took about, it took about uh, 900 soldiers. It was a big expense for Rome to get him there and then a big expense to get him to Rome. No, he had them pay for it. But he got there. For what reason? To preach the gospel in the household of Nero. It says that members of Nero's household became believers. And then, we don't know, but he may have gone to Spain because he was under house arrest. He was an imperial prisoner, so as long as he traveled with imperial guards, he could go anywhere he wanted. And they say he went to Spain, so we don't know. Maybe he did make it to Spain. He wanted to go to Spain, we know that. Paul, he shared it. Paul, who was a Pharisee, who grew up in this system of sacrifice, figured it out by God's grace and the Holy Spirit. And he could not be quiet about it. We have this fullest confidence that he has already paid for our sins. Jesus has paid for it. That's the good news. It's no good news if you go preach to somebody, you got to believe in Jesus, now make this pilgrimage. you got to believe in Jesus, now give 25% of what you earn to the church. you got to follow Jesus, so you got to go make this sacrifice or that sacrifice. Or you got to say this many prayers. you got to do these kinds of things. No. No, because if you pay for it all, then what am I paying? I'm only paying out of rejoicing and, and joy. That's why it says in Hebrews, come together as God's people. Don't come together and encourage one another that our sins are forgiven, that we are God's children. That's what we encourage each other. So by this once and for all sacrifice, then Christ freely has given us the promise of standing in His presence in the most holy place for all eternity. The most holy place is where God is. And God is in His heaven. He is on His throne with the Lamb. That's what seven revelation. The Lamb are on the throne. There is nothing left to be done with regard to salvation. As it has always been with the Father, He has provided the acceptable sacrifice for our sins. The Father provided it. The Father provided it. So, now, what do we get to do? We get to love God. 
We get to love God and be loved by God. We get to praise God, lift Him up on our praises. We get to do that. We get to honor Him. We get to love one another as Jesus has loved us. And for those, because your sins have been covered like mine. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. That's who we are. We have been covered head to toe with the blood of Jesus Christ. What? Once for all. Once for all. Once for all, O sinner, receive it. Once for all, O friend, now receive it. Cling to the cross. The burden will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. Amen. Amen. Let that peace of God, therefore, that passes our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting. Amen.